thank you for receiving me at home uh, of the Lakota Nation, that now is Republic of Lakota. I'm happy to be here and have the chance to talk to you and ask some questions that we are interested to know. The first thing we do want to know for my people in Peru and all the Andean people is what was the beginning for Lakota Nation? How long take it to burn this nation? Well, in our creation story, we come from the five sisters in the universe. And those sisters, or seven sisters, excuse me, not five sisters, seven sisters, s uh, stars that are in the, and we came to the water. And then from the water we emerged and became Lakota. Now, <clears throat> when we came to this earth, We were warned by the, we call the great mystery, not to come. But we were tricked. We do not have a devil, no such thing. We do not believe in evil. There is no evil in the universe. So, but we have a trickster. He likes to trick us. And he tricked this one family onto this earth. And they fell in love with the buffalo. And to make a long story short, when they came back and they told other families, they convinced other families to come out. So when we left the great mystery, the great mystery told us, when you have made your decision, you go out there, as the buffalo go, so go the Lakota. Now the white man almost murdered, massacred all the buffalo. A hundred and um, 110 years ago, almost all the buffalo were gone. Almost all the Lakota were gone. Then the white man decided to save the buffalo and to save us. So he put the buffalo on a reservation. Here is the here is our land. Here's our land. Here's our reservation. He put us there. Over here, he had an even smaller reservation for the buffalo. Put the buffalo there. The buffalo start growing. We start growing as a people. And then they started breeding the buffalo with cows. And the buffalo spread. We started leaving the reservation and breeding with white people. And we spread. So that's the story of my people. Now. You see, 157 years ago, we were free. And we militarily defeated the United States government, the United States of America, on the field of battle. And they begged us for peace. We had no knowledge of liars. We did not think that responsible human beings would lie. 
that grown men, old white men, we did not believe they would lie, but they do, all the time. To themselves they lie. So we made peace with them and we, we gave them what they needed and we even gave them more than what they needed. We even gave them a piece of our land, you know. Just leave us alone. Well, they didn't leave us alone. They kept lying and kept lying and our land kept shrinking and it kept shrinking to today. But remember, that was 105 150, 60 years ago. They, those, my people, my ancestors had children. Those children never went to white man's schools. They didn't go to the white man churches. And then the white man outlawed our religion, our way of life. Not that we don't have religion. We have a way of life. And that was outlawed. When he put us on this little tiny reservation, this is what you see here. But those children of our, of our ancestors who were, had been free, they never went to school, so they still had a, a purity of heart and the beauty of the mind, you know? They were not contaminated by the white man. No education, no religion. So we had to hide out here in the open. We had to hide and pretend that we were okay with them. But at night we would go into these creeks where there are, are, are trees and we would hide and have our secret ceremonies. Otherwise they would put us in, in prison if they caught us praying. But those, those, those young children that the, my ancestors had, they became my grandparents. I got to grow up with those, those people who never went to school. Okay, so they had this beauty about them, this wisdom, and they passed it on. One of the things they told us, my, he was my grandpa, but he always called me nephew, so I always called him uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he didn't know English too good, you know, so anyway, He told me, we must never forget that we were once a free people. For if we ever forget that we were free, we will cease to be Lakota. No more. No more Lakota. So I remember that. In 1974, we had a conference for all indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. But only the Indian people from Canada and the United States could come. And they all had to come here on, with their own money and their own food. But we had this meeting. Over 5,000 of the people came. Now, in all of North America, you see the white man... He says, he says there were 14 million in Tikana, in North America, United States and Canada. He's, that's what he says, 14 million. Well, he killed almost 14 million. Okay? So there's only about a million of us left. In all North America. In all North America. You have more Indian people in Peru than we have in all of North America. Yeah. Now, 
So that 5,000 people who came to our convention and they had to pay their own way to our meeting, that's a fantastic number, you know? Because we're very, very poor. But those old people were still alive, the ones who never went to school, who couldn't speak English, they could not speak English, they're still alive and they, and they watched the meeting and they, they listened and then at the end of the meeting they told us what to do. They told us to do two things. To get the world, the international community, all the nations of the people to recognize us. Indians. That's indigenous. So we did that. We went out, we formed the International Indian Treaty Council, we had this, we helped with the United Nations have our first meetings in Geneva, Switzerland in 1977. We did that. From that meeting grew a movement. We did more than what the old people told us to do. They, they wanted us, the indigenous people, the indigenous of, of, the, of the Western Hemisphere, all of the Americas, to be recognized. But we got all the indigenous people in the entire world recognized. And a year ago in September, in, in, in September of 07, the white man's year, the United Nations recognized the rights of indigenous people all over the world. Everybody voted for it, even Peru. Everybody in the world except four countries, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Yeah. All English-speaking countries. Okay. The only ones that voted against it. China voted for it. Russia, they all have indigenous people. All the South American, Central American countries voted for it because it was a non-binding resolution. It means nothing except goodwill. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it means. But those four countries said, no. They refused to do this. They refused to do this. I know. They said, we don't exist, we're not important. So, that's the kind of country I live in. Now, my people live in. So that second, the second thing those old people told us to do was to never forget that we were once a free people and that to, we had to reestablish our freedom. So, after the United Nations recognized the indigenous people of the world, including us, we then went to freedom. And so I traveled around by myself and with one other man every once in a while because the gasoline was very high cost and I could only afford gasoline for myself and him. So we went around to all my people, Lakota, all my people. Lakota in the white man's language, the best translation is, it means a people together. People together, you know, with a good heart, with one heart. So, um, I went around to my people. Now, since they put us on these little pieces of land here and there, called reservations, they're really concentration camps. And they won't let us do anything except go to school. Biggest mistake in our lives, to let our children go to school. They, we had no choice. They forced it. They would come to the house, grab our children, and take them off, and we wouldn't see them again. They're adults. It's called boarding schools. 
And there, like my parents went. See, my grandpa didn't go. But my parents were forced, because they were born in 1914. They came and grabbed him, took him to these schools. Wouldn't let him speak their language. Forced him to be Christians. And killed them, tortured them, sexually molested them. And beat them. And then when they had beaten them down and trained their minds, they let them come back here. So this is the kind of Indian people we have to work with. People who have lost everything. But there were still those that hid their children. You know? They hid them. So we... We managed to survive. And in our way of life, a little bit of our way of life survived. As best we could. But we have an old saying. When I was born, 1939, 70 winters ago, my mother and father, because they had been forced into boarding schools and they were molested, they didn't want their children going. So they left the reservation. They went to to work in the United States war machine, war industries, you know? The only place they could get a job. And raised us out in California. But they'd bring us home every summer, you know? And even one year I came here and stayed and went to school and I quit school. <laughs> I didn't want to be brainwashed. But at any rate, uh, because of their experience, they didn't want their children turning out that way. So we got an education in the white man's schools, but we also got to learn our way of life, you know? Free from fear. So that changed us, different from my folks. And it changed us from, from uh, most of the people who went to boarding school. Because their spirit had been crushed and they lived in fear. And they still do around here. Now, they live in fear. So my people, when we decided to remember what the old people said and told us to be free, well, me and this man, we went around to my people for five months. And in 07, um, in the summertime and in the fall. And we got um, enough people to agree that we should be free. Now we have made, because remember, we defeated the white man? Well, we made a treaty with him, an international treaty according to his laws. And that's what he's been lying to us about since. While well, he kills us, smothers us to death. So we went to Washington, D.C., four of us, as representatives of a small part of our people who still want to be free. Not all the people want to be free. <laughs> we have a saying, as I mentioned earlier. You can capture a wolf and put it into a cage. That wolf will always try to escape the cage. But if that wolf has pups in the cage, those pups will never try to escape the cage. It's my people today. Okay? So we go around and there's enough of them still want freedom. They're the ones who still l uh, try to live our way of life. Okay? Our spiritual way of life. So they hang on to those 
those teachings. And we went to Washington, four of us went to Washington, and we formally withdrew from our treaties with the United States of America, which means because we are a superior country, we are a superior nation, when we withdrew from our treaties with the United States, they no longer have any say-so over us. We're a free and independent country. We go back to what we was when we signed the treaty. And that's where we are today. That's why you have here, this is the capital <laughs> of the Republic, the free Republic of Lakota. That is good because in, in our country, in our nation, <clears throat> because long time we got to go to school, long time we got to share a lot of different tradition, not, not us. And finally, like you said, many people doesn't want to be free. Just keep living like any government coming and doing corrupt or not. Right. And they say, okay, that is the modern life. They say we have to accept it now. But the thing is, when they destroy culture, they destroy everything. That's the problem. Well, we need to survive all of them. That's why I see really interesting when Republic of Lakota show future idea, plan, goal, right? Like treat school or kind of new investments, trying to do something in our way. What you can tell us about your projects like Republic of Lakota, Free Republic? Well, first of all, I have militarily fought with my, I used to belong to a militant Indian organization called the American Indian Movement. In the 1970s, just over the hill at Wounded Knee, we fought the United States of America. They surrounded us and we fought them and we won. They came to the table again. We went, we beat them again. Like a little mouse against a lion, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they agreed to everything we demanded. And we even went to their courts, their criminal courts, and they couldn't convict us. Because they're such liars and crooks. And we caught them lying and we caught them being crooked, you know? So that's how we won. And then I fought against the Sandinistas. We were invited down to uh, Nicaragua and with the Mosquito and the Sumo and the Rama, Indian people down there who were fighting against the Sandinistas, the communists. So, me uh, my Lakota. I am who I am. I am not a, a washita, I am not a white man. I don't believe in his ways. I have fought against the capitalist giant and the communist giant. Now I don't believe in the gun. Yeah. But like any natural animal, when you're cornered, in a corner, and it's a matter of survival, then you fight. And when my people are about to disappear, I choose to fight. Because I'm in a corner. I have children, I have grandchildren, and I have great-grandchildren. But I no longer will pick up the gun. I don't believe in it. My people, my ancestors, we never believed in that. If we did, the white man wouldn't be here. Yeah, it's the same thing in South America. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> yeah. So I know that's the way we are. We lived, he says, he has a religion that if you obey his religion, you'll go to heaven. We come from heaven. 
That's where we lived in the Western Image. I get chills. Our ancestors, we had no disease. That's heaven. We had no jails, we had no locks, no keys, no prisons, no disease. That's heaven. We knew how to live with all of life. That's heaven. We know how to live with the trees. We know how to live with the insects. We know how to live with the jaguar. You know? And yet, the white man, he thinks he's, he's still looking for that. And he came here and he crushed heaven. He crushed heaven. Heaven on earth. We can think far beyond what he's capable. But at any rate, and that's because of our woman. That's why we are so far ahead of the white man. I pity the white man. Because he doesn't know the beauty and the value of the woman. At any rate. So we I have fought against that. And now we are a free republic living up to the white man's law. That's why we're free. Because we're living up to his laws. So he can't come in with his guns because we've got no guns. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. And we're still willing to live with him. Just like our ancestors. See? We still believe in heaven. <laughs> and we're still willing to live with him. And that's why David's here. That's what the meaning of my nation is, a people together. One of our spiritual instructions is, you know, the English language is a very bad language, a very primitive language. You can't express yourself in English. You know? You can't tell the truth in English. It's a deceitful language. It is a language of liars. And because it got so many words that mean that mean different things, but you say it the same way. It's an idiotic language. It's really sad. Yeah. And so when I listen to an English speaker, I feel sorry for them. Because their language means they can't talk from the heart. It's incapable. The language keeps them prisoners, keeps their hearts prisoners. Isn't that sad? Anyway, so we live up to their laws, to their papers, and they can't do anything. I mean, they will eventually. I mean, if, if they perceive us to be a threat, they'll kill us. So we're not a threat. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. And now, now as I watch the, the, the white man's world fall apart around him, <laughs> I remember the teachings of my ancestors, you know? And you and I get to live in the time when the white man's destroying himself. And he always does it. He always does it. The Spaniards did it. The English did it. The Dutch did it. Yeah. Germans did it. English did it. Americans are doing it now. The one thing I, <coughs> I want to tell you that's a little bit experience, and I have a younger friend, 18 years old. He was really interested in guy from Colombia. He went to high school. And one, one day he told me, he asked me, you know what happened? Well, my, my teacher is black. And my teacher talk about history in the world and geography. I say, you are wrong. The American teaching in different way. They say the world is 
I don't know how many continents. And we know that it's only five. How is, how is, how is that? They have like particular history to teach. And when he tried to ask and do questions, the teacher said, you are communist. Get out of here. You're a bad example for my other students. <laughs> students. So what the hell is this? And he's black. And when I asked about the black, mm -hmm. and he is black, he said, I'm not black. I said, how, how, is, how is that? I'm not black. I'm American. This answer makes me reflection about what happened now. Because when the, <coughs> any nation, like African nation coming like a slave here, uh -huh. if they love, lost the roots, lost everything. That's why they can say, I'm American. What that is? For African people, what that means? You are not free anymore, right? Right. That is, the, that, that is the, my, my thinking when I read the, <coughs> the news about the president, how they try to say to the Indians, you are not believer. It's like, hey, you are nothing. Yes. Right? You <laughs> caught that. Good for you. Because we caught it. I caught it. The rest of my Indian people, they, they're like that black man. They think Obama is, is the new God, the new Jesus. You know? The black man come over from Africa, a slave, for centuries. His only role model is a white male, not the female, the white male. That goes for a black woman. Their only role model is a white male. So how are they going to turn out? Not only did he say that we are non-believers, this black man, new president of the United States. But he also said in that speech, and we pointed it out, kinds of tribes will be dissolved. The only lines of tribes in this entire country are Indians. Of course. <laughs> it's all around the world. Yeah. It's, it's the same work for us. They say for, um, for Peruvian people, if I am Chanca, I cannot have chance to be Chanka anymore. I have to be just Peruvian. Yeah. <laughs> that is the line between uh, nations like should be Chanka, Costco, mm -hmm. Aymara, wherever. Forget it. You are Peruvian. Like he said, I'm not black. I'm American. Right. And so that when he says that, the lines of tribes shall dissolve. That means he's going to get rid of the reservations now. He's going to get rid of us. I point that out, and I'm getting condemned by my own people. I mean, the pups in the cage. It's hard to people to see when everything is like uh, the beginning, like huge party, huge festival, huge happiness, that they expected he can do something because everybody is scared about the economic situation. So they expected he had to do something good. That what happened if this is something good for the 500 millions of people and really bad for the Indian nation? What they can say, they just closed their eyes. I didn't see nothing. That is the huge problem for us, how you can s tell the truth when the people want to be blind. We saw in Peru 10 years of war where a terrorist coming. And between terrorists and government, they killed like 60,000 Indian people who died in Peru in 10 years. It's not white people, no. Yeah. It's Indian people. Sometimes entire billions disappear. They put inside the church and bore all them, children, women, and all, all them as animals. 
They were doing that to the San, uh, down in Nicaragua when we went down there. Yeah. So that is the thing the people don't want to see this kind of truth. I don't know how we can deal with it because my people, my friends, my relatives, sometimes they, they, w they don't want to see what could be coming next month, next year. Well, you know, in working at the United Nations like I did, or with the, the actually I didn't work with the United Nations. I worked with the, the countries in the United Nations, okay? Our organization, and we put them, um, we had an office there in New York City for 12 years. And I go back and forth from here to New York City, work. What I learned from the international community and, and my own people is that my ancestors, first of all, my ancestors way back, they thought it was their duty for every step they take upon the earth, they are to think how that step is going to affect at least seven generations. So whatever you do in this life, you and me, we have to understand that whatever we do is going to affect at least seven generations. So we have to think that far ahead. That's the beauty of being Indio. Indio. In with God. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and um, that's the beauty of it. We think of seven generations. You know, a white man doesn't think of seven generations. He thinks of a bank. Or he thinks of money. That's all he thinks of. Uh, and how that money, is, his step is going to make more money. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering, I look around the world and I see and I watch the Palestinians. They get bombed and shot at and tortured and jailed and, and starved every day. And yet they've been fighting for over half a century. They've been resisting. They live in open, just like we do, in open air prison camps, you know? But they're being bombed and all of that. But they keep fighting, why? Because they control the education of their future. They control the education of their young. And that's why you see this huge teepee out here. That's a school. It's going to be a school for my children. And I no longer think that when I, like when I was young, I want to free all the Indians. I want to free all the indigenous people. No. I want to free my children and my unborn generations. You know? And I got to, therefore, I've got to think small. I've got to think of just this little area right here. The universe shines on this area like it does every place. So therefore, you utilize the universe and you take your children at three years of age and you don't let them go into the white man world. You keep them in our world. And you teach them the way your ancestors taught. You teach them outside. The smartest thing we ever did. And this is true of Indicana people all over the world. The only thing we ever built was our bedroom. Think of that. That's all we ever built was our bedroom. And the rest of the world was our living room. Because it was alive. And we have to relate to it. So that's what we're going to teach. And surprisingly, when you go back and you find out what we had to learn as children, we had to learn about the trees. We had to learn about the insects, the grasses, the flowers, the medicines. We had to learn about the animals, the birds. We had to learn about everything. That's science. That's botany, biology. 
geology. We had to learn about our, our mother of the earth, our grandmother of the earth. That's geology. We had to learn about the stars. That's astronomy. Our children, by the time they were in the third and fourth grade, they'd already been introduced to all these scientists. The white man doesn't teach his children any of that until they get way older. That's why we lived in heaven in 1491. Yeah. So that's, that is the way my revolution is going. I believe in revolution because everything that is holy and sacred is round. You and I are round. The rain is round. My grandmother of the earth is round. The sun is round. The stars are round. The clouds are round. Everything's round. Now the life is round. <laughs> now, revolution, one revolution. That's what I believe. Just one revolution. Going back to where you started. But you can't do it like that. Freedom, it's very simple. If you want to be free, you're free to be responsible. Our ancestors were responsible for seven, at least seven generations. Now we call my language Pachakutik. Mm -hmm. Pachakutik means exactly like you say, the world life turned on 36 degrees to the beginning. It's Pachakutik. Mm -hmm. So we understand what it means this. Uh, we, of course, the life is for us thinking this way. But we have one problem. I think it's the same problem in my country or here. What happened? with the other nations, that they are not originally, or they lost his roots. Because we live with them, a lot of them, right? Actually, not all of them, they are government, politician, corrupted, and uh, like enemies, right? It's a lot of people, it's try to live in a good, mm -hmm. good way. So that's very important because we like respect. Life is respect for every life around the world. Mm -hmm. So there's another people like us with a different nation, a different situation. We need to have some kind of relation to respect that is <coughs> give me the one of other questions somebody uh, at, uh, before I come in here ask me ask to Russell what I can do for help them she's not Indian <laughs> and said well I will ask <laughs> right because it's different people, we need to have kind of relationship with them too, right? Yes. And that's what we believe, and that's why you see da David here, David. He's here, and um, there are many non-Indians coming to our land once again. Once again. Come on around. The white man's busy destroying his life. Now you got people inside America and in Canada, white people, who want freedom again. So they're looking to us again. It's just, it's, history repeats itself, you know? But it's, um, it's okay. What I think what uh, 
What I tell non-Indians is, uh, what can they do? Well, it depends on their situation. But we need help in getting our school off the ground for our children. That's the main thing. And um, I don't know, does this woman have a computer? Ming, for me, that's the general, the general question because it's millions of people outside the Indian nation. And when the, <clears throat> the government decide to dissolve the frontier mm -hmm. and make a business with all the lands here, they will not consult these people, right? Right. They just do it. So the people, if they know, probably they can do something. Wait a moment. We don't need that. We need to be live in respect, right? It's kind of attitude they can do for themselves too, because you respect somebody, and you gotta respect too. That is the wrong way relationship. Um, you know, we're just like all natural life, because we're natural human beings. And what happens with natural life is when the white man comes, we flee. We leave. And then he, then he, he kills those that cannot leave, the trees, the animals, the birds, he kills everything. The humans. He kills all of life for that piece of land. Okay? But what he doesn't get is natural people do not want to live with unnatural people. There's an old Indian up in Canada. He was talking to an anthropologist. And the anthropologist Ask him, how come you Indian people don't like to work? And that old man thought for a while, and then he said, you know, we Indians, we can understand your concept of work. But what we don't understand is vacations. <laughs> how come... You want to leave what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's that's the way I, I you know, I, I feel sorry yeah. for the oppressor because uh, he only ends up oppressing himself. Yeah. Now, you know, I... There are a lot of answers you can give to people who want to do good. There's, there's a lot, you know. But what I used to say in the American Indian Movement when I was young, when I, was, when I believed in our struggle, which I no longer believe in, I used to tell them, go clean up your backyard before you try to clean my backyard. You know? It's like the animal. That same old man, he says, you know, you white people are very arrogant people. You believe that you are responsible for the extinction of all these animals and birds. He said, have you ever thought that maybe those animals and birds, they don't want to live with you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the kind of life that they do, the civilization. That's the problem. The way how they live is become destroyed everything. The world, entire world now, it's almost destroyed. It's let me tell you something. Because we do not have the devil, I tell you, we have the trickster. In our language, it's heyoka, 
the Heyoka. The Heyoka does everything backwards. So the white man is a Heyoka. He does everything wrong. Huh? He's the trickster. And so when he says he's civilized, I know that he means he's uncivilized because he's the trickster. He lives backwards. So if he calls me uncivilized, that's a compliment because he lives backwards. He's calling me civilized. <laughs> yeah. My ancestors lived in heaven. It was the entire Western Hemisphere. You know, we didn't... Those grave robbers that call themselves archaeologists, that go around robbing our graves, they found out in all our graves that are bef there before the coming of the women that we didn't even have tooth decay. We didn't even have tooth decay. We lived in heaven, man. Yeah. The concept for us and <clears throat> the Chanka nation and other nation is, is very the same. <clears throat> the life is every and everybody. So if you if you think it even this table of a life, you gotta respect. That's all about. That is the way the white people or civilization doesn't understand. Right. They'd be proud. That's why it's it's like impossible to live with this kind of way. The way what they live make impossible. You know, there's an old man he told me, he said, you know, if you look at all of life Every one of those lives, the trees, the insects, the worms, the snakes, the birds, everything, all of life, they still follow the instructions they were given by the great mystery to them in the beginning. We're the only ones, the human being, that do not follow those original instructions. Now, the white man believes his power of reason makes him superior to all of life. Put a white man in the forest by himself. <laughs> he cannot survive, you know? <laughs> because he has no respect. And he has forgotten his instructions. So he thinks the power of reason makes him a superior animal when it makes him the most, it makes him only confused. He does, it makes him very forgettable. He forgets the original instructions on how to live. Because he's not natural. He doesn't live natural. So that power of reason is a curse because it gives you two paths. You can take the path of reason and confusion or you can take the path of natural life. Now all the rest of life in the world takes that path of natural life. The only one that doesn't do it is the male, the human male. I want to ask you the last, last question, or more than question, is a kind of message that we need to share. A uh, all Indian culture in America and all around the world. What do you think we need to do now, together, in this time?
Just one thing. And I mentioned it earlier. Is you take you take the um, control of your young. And you return, you return, you take control of your young, and you and your young return as best as you can to the original instructions of our ancestors. And that isn't hard to do. And that way you find the path, the road to a, towards freedom. And freedom, as I mention all the time, freedom simply means you are free to be responsible. Seven generations. Very good. I think we're down. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good to have. And thank you for these great gifts. <laughs> I appreciate this. Me. This is in my heart. Mm. And this will be in my stomach. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> I love this. My wife, my wife really makes good meals mm. with this.